Welcome, everybody. My name is Howard Lauthen. I am director of the Center for Austrian Studies here at the University of Minnesota. And we're very pleased to welcome you to our annual International Holocaust Remembrance Day lecture. This event is sponsored by three um, in institutes here at the Center for uh, at, at the University of Minnesota, the Center for Austrian Studies, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and the Center for Jewish Studies, and we're grateful uh, for their support. Our speaker today is Dr. Andreas Kranabitter, who was most recently a fellow at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. We uh, discussed the possibilities of bringing Dr. Kranabitter out to uh, Minnesota in person. Unfortunately, they did not work out and he is joining us today from from Vienna um perhaps a, as as we were just discussing a moment ago not a bad thing when you wake up in the morning and it's 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 minus 6 degrees fahrenheit outside if not even colder uh but regardless we we are delighted to to have Andreas with us today Andreas is a political scientist and sociologist he's currently serving as the head of the archive for the History of Sociology in Austria at the University of Graz. But uh, in a very welcome move, he has just recently been appointed the new director of the Documentation Center for Austrian Resistance in Vienna, which is a, really a, a marvelous position, a position that he will begin in, in April. Um, Dr. Kronenbitter is a very uh, productive scholar, uh, a far too long a list of monographs and articles to uh, to highlight. Uh, but briefly, um, recent publications include Authoritarianism, Ambivalence, Ambiguity, uh, The Life and Work of Elsa Franco Brunswick, uh, which will come out as a special edition of the journal Serendipities, Journal for the Sociology and History, of the social sciences. He is also at work on a monograph, The Construction of Criminals, the Imprisonment of Professional Criminals in the Mauthausen Concentration Camp. With that said, let me turn things over to Dr. Kranabitta, who will, um, who will take us forward with the talk today. So thank you, Andreas. We're, again, very pleased to have you. Thank you oh, very much. Let me say one other thing, just logistically as as well. We will be using the Q and A box for any questions that you may have. So during the lecture, uh, as questions come up, please please use that. And then after the talk, we'll be having some time, of course, for Q and A uh, through that means. So thank you. Okay, once more, over to you. Thank you very much, Howard, for this introduction, and thank you also for the invitation. It would have been a pleasure to take part in person in Minnesota, but not only due to the weather report, but also due to the fact that I just moved back to Europe and I'm a bit jet lagged. It's probably really a good idea to do this on Zoom. So thank you. Uh, I also want to thank the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the Center for Austrian Studies, and the Center for, for Jewish Studies for the invitation, as well as you mentioned, it's the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., for the opportunity that uh, they provided me with this fellowship uh, and the research that I could do in 2020 and 2022, which I will present to you right now in this lecture. So let me try to share my screen. If this works and try to just... Mm -hmm. so, this way. so what is this research about? It is about uh, early research on concentration camps before they were history. This means before, while, or immediately after liberation. So many of the reports by survivors were done by survivors who have been trained as social scientists or were later on becoming social scientists. This is for the one part. The other part is, which I want to focus on right now, uh, research done under the labels of propaganda or psychological warfare for intelligence reports written by GIs, by members of the U.S. Army, of the so-called Psychological Warfare Division, PWD, of the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, 
or the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, or other institutions. In my view, so despite this kind of negative connotations that you have with propaganda and psychological warfare, many of these reports were collected in a genuinely sociological way and have produced insights that are relevant for today's research on concentration camps, as well as on the broader question of how to study genocide right after it happens in a social scientific way. At the same time, for me, um, Focusing on those who did these reports uh, means researching military and intellectual uh, resistance against national socialism. From the perspective of a sociology of knowledge, this research could be called a third culture of knowledge production, which means that it's not on the one hand knowledge production, more of this individual literary evaluation of events and not juristic on the other hand. So it's not concerned with more or less sensational news as journalists had to be to whatever consent uh, extent not concerned with individual responsibilities of crimes as the war crimes investigation teams had to investigate it is not concerned with the literary processing of one's own um, experience of the holocaust at the camps in general but it is a social scientific and this means a methodologically thoughtful investigation into collective experience aiming at a theoretical understanding of a phenomenon like the concentration camps. This kind of research uses statistical methods when, for example, estimating German casualties. It used interview techniques when interrogating German prisoners of war or civilians, and also to interview uh, the liberated concentration camp prisoners in order to understand the way of average German opinion, the soldiers' opinion, and also some kind of uh, average opinion of concentration camp survivors of the so-called prisoner society. It considered sampling methods when um, selecting so-called informants due to gender, social class, occupation, regional origin, or previous membership in political parties. And it used social psycho psychology when analyzing this interview material. The reports on concentration camp were written in this context of intelligence uh, work that was done. The picture you can see here is for me some kind of a visualization of this social order of uh, the so-called elite, uh, the, the so-called propaganda. You can see Hans Habe, whom you could call the editor-in-chief of uh, propaganda issues and also one of the chief instructors, uh, instructors and his so-called Habe Circus. What does that mean? So Hans Habe was a journalist of Austrian and Hungarian backgrounds. And what you can see here, so you can see him sitting uh, in front of the window and to his right standing is Stefan Heim, the famous writer Stefan Heim. And to his left is Joseph Eaton, the sociologist who is not that well known. But for me, this is the kind of social order of uh, propaganda. It is journalism in the middle uh, with as well the, the creative ways of writing with Stefan Heim on the one hand and social science on the other hand uh, visualized by Joseph Eaton here. So what kinds of documents uh, can I rely on in this research? It's of course documents in the National Archives and Records Administration but it's also and most uh, prominently reports and observations made by those in the field that can, can today be found in the private papers of officials of the PWD or the OSS in various archives. For example, in private uh, papers that were donated to museums like the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, or also to university archives uh, throughout the world. Uh, what this allows to me is not to write some kind of official military history of a certain unit or also of the military training, not of facilities, but um, a kind of uh, view from the history of the sciences, especially the history of the social sciences and knowledge production, uh, a view on the practice of these um, intelligence workers on the field that you can read through their papers with all their interactions with concentration camp survivors, civilians, or also perpetrators. This research project then is uh, some kind of Praxeological research pro uh, project, uh, which means that it's concerned with thinking produced in action, and this is the focus I'm relying on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm relying on. I'm, I'm focusing on the process of doing social science and of learning by doing. In my research, and I will come back to this um, in the next 
view in the next in the course of my talk i focus on these five uh, people mainly this is albert g rosenberg maurice b parlov joseph w eaton saul k padova and elma lachterhand and as you can see here this is just to give you some kind of overview about their um paths um they all at a certain point were taking part in the liberation of uh, the concentration camps or visited those concentration camps upon their uh, liberation. They all wrote some kind of notes, reports, letters back to uh, in private letters or official letters, also drafts of book projects or even dissertations as in the, in the case of Elma Lachterhand. And they all continued to be uh, or became social uh, scientists after liberation. There's of course no time to go into detail concerning all of their work, but uh, I want to suggest to follow them uh, through on their path through um, the liberated uh, areas of Germany and Austria and to state some general observations. The story is, of course, connected to, to the, the story of the Ritchie boys. Uh, when I started this research some 10 years ago, not very many people knew very much about the so-called Ritchie boys. I think this has fortunately changed uh, due to documentaries done since the early 2000s and also due to research done um, by, uh, by scholars like Beverly Eddy, Florian uh, Trausnick, uh, Robert Lackner or Bruce Henderson and many more. So what does the term Ritchie boys refer to, refer to? It refers to military intelligence training camps in uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania called Camp Ritchie and Camp Sharp, um, where quite many exiled people, people who forced, were forced into exile from Germany and Austria were trained uh, in military intelligence, who were forced into exiles as exile as Jews and as political opponents. Um, as Hans Habe has recalled, and I quoted, quote him, to form military companies out of this genius unit, as they were often called in the army, was not necessarily an enviable task. Very many of them were quite famous uh, and well-known writers like Klaus Mann or Stefan Heim, or comedians like the Austrian comedian George uh, Georg Kreisler, or Hollywood's greats like Hanusch Burger or Walter Kohner. Many more were artists, intellectual, philosophy professors, linguists, and so on and so on. They were called and also they recollected, uh, they, they, they were thought of as characters, as Daniel Lerner put it, one of them, and one of the chronists of the uh, psychological warfare. And as such, they were a graveyard of military discipline. So some people refused, um, as Hanusch Burger, to put on the smelly underpants during the fights or resisted like Oscar Seidling climbing rope ladders into the speedboats. And orders were said to be only ob obeyed after lengthy international negotiations. Among these characters were some uh, social scientists and some with social scientist training, um, especially behind the scenes, especially when it comes to providing the material for training and especially when it comes to providing the the research for doing the job so some of them were Maurice Chenowitz, Daniel Lerner, Saul Padova or Edward Hartshorn. Um, people like Guy Stern who was also taking part in this later recalled that neither before nor after at university had I ever had worked so intensively as at Camp Ritchie. The main objective of this psychological warfare against Nazi Germany was to destroy the fighting morale of the Wehrmacht and was always subordinated to the strategic goal of forcing Wehrmacht soldiers to surrender. And this is one example I want to show you. This is a leaflet and some millions of leaflets were uh, thrown to, uh, beyond enemy lines by artillery shells or by or dropped from planes. This is why they were also called the confetti soldiers. Um, and this was the, the kind of psychology you needed to make them surrender. It's of course not to, to tell them directly to surrender, but to tell them to give them uh, a kind of support. And in case they wanted to surrender, the only thing that they had to do was say these two words, I surrender, with a very German and Austrian phonetic translation of the surrender term you can see here on this leaflet. 
Um, I would argue this, uh, that this not only needed some kind of basic psychology, but uh, to make in order to obtain really a good result of uh, propaganda, you had to know some kind of the average opinion of the German prisoner of war at first to do that. And this is exactly what the sociologists behind the scenes like Maurice Janowitz and Edward Shields were saying when they referred to propaganda as the sociological and psychological analysis which the propagandist must make if he is to obtain maximum response to his communications. Shields was also someone who was very knowledgeable of the contemporary literature on national socialism as he was the translator of Ernst Frenkel's Doppelstaat and he was also someone who compiled the questionnaire together with Henry Dix, a British um, uh, psychiatrist, aiming at quantifying this uh, opinion of Wehrmacht soldiers. Thus, there were well-known sociologists of this time who played a role in the setup of propaganda, and there were sociologists who were soci sociologists before they came to the to camps Ritchie and Sharp to train there. However, I would argue that it was not the training that made them social scientists. Um, it was a training of eight weeks, which uh, was set up quite hastily, contrarily to what. Uh, some official, more official histories of the US Army uh, would want to, to make believe with a lot of improvisation. Uh, it was this improvisation, I would argue, not the plan which proved, provided the basis for the independent and creative research. So the training at the MITCs was an eight, eight week program, including uh, not only interrogation techniques, but also interpreting aerial photographs and maps. Um, the enemy order of battle, close combat, and so on and so on. The question is not only what you can learn in eight weeks, but it's not a college degree. And we know that it's not a college degree making you a social scientist, but it's the practice of being a social scientist making you one. Um, this is for me important because it's, it, 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 it kind of uh, refutes the narrative of a well-prepared army training expert and lays the, the, the focus on the people doing the work and improvising, creatively improvising this work. So one uh, primary uh, observation I would uh, state is that even though it is always or very often said that there was a boost of, um, of positivist quantitative research during World War II in the history of the social sciences and the history of the sciences uh, in general, on the ground, it was much less positivist and, gr and continually uh, growing to be less possible, more flex flexible on the ground. One example for this is Albert G. Rosenberg and the so-called elite interrogation group called Kampfgruppe Rosenberg. Uh, the team had several assignments, starting with the quantitative service of German prisoners of war, using the questionnaires I uh, mentioned above. And I want to quote Daniel Lerner, I mentioned before as well, one of the chronists of the psychological warfare. The production of systematic field intelligence for quantitative analysis required interviewing hundreds of German prisoners every week. Among the most successful results were those obtained by special PWD interrogation team known informally as Kampfgruppe Rosenberg. Their pooled resources comprised some familiarity with all the major European languages. In processing so large and incessant the flow, they had perforce to operate by feel, as some of them put it by smell, in rapidly separating strong Nazis from non-Nazis, lies from truthful responses, voluble from tongue-tied personalities. This means that you can argue, of course, what this kind of project is, but it's not positive is to tell people by feel or by smell, but it is a much more subtle way of doing research in order to do this intelligence job. So I would argue that once Rosenberg's group was literally in the field, they abandoned this quantitative focus for more pragmatic approaches since the schedule of this research was set by the enemy, by the Nazi and the, the Wehrmacht and the SS and not by academic uh, social science. This is important to me because Rosenberg uh, and this is something you can get out of his reports quite clearly, um, was developing very creative ideas of doing research. So when he came to POW camps, it wasn't really uh, possible, even though he was himself born in Göttingen and uh, from German 
uh, descent, he was not able to gather all the information himself. It was even getting dangerous at some points. So what he did was to develop this idea of assembling a reliable anti-fascist POW group that was as representative as possible in terms of region, class background, and rank, who would subsequently assist in collecting data by doing the research themselves. And this is especially what he did as well when he was assigned the task of um, uh, providing a thorough investigation of the concentration camp Buchenwald after liberation on April 11th. So when they started to get there in April 16th, the first thing they did was to compile this group of former prisoners, helping them to compile report, reports. And this is the so-called Buchenwald report, which I came, I will come back later to which is impressive because it's the first uh, social scientist study of concentration camp at all with 168 reports from 104 informants. What they did is develop then an own methodology that was going way beyond what they were trained in or what they were supposed to do. Another example is Saul Padova, who did uh, a study in Aachen, the first major city in Germany, which was liberated and where about 11,000 civilians had remained. Their task was actually to screen the population of Aachen uh, for national socialist undergrounds, Wehrwölfe as they were called. And what they did actually was more than that. They also did the first sociological survey of the German population, the so-called Aachen report, uh, typology of um, psychological types of uh, German and Austrian, in this case, uh, German population. They also developed ideas or they found out something uh, very similar to contemporary social science, like the submission to a powerful authority. That is, that whatever this con authority was concretely, people would submit to this authority as a very typical national socialist state of uh, psycholog psychological mind. But it did not reflect the interview situation they uh, produced themselves. So they started with uh, a very authoritarian uh, interview situation and even wrote, and I quote, arrangement should be such as to give the interrogated appearance of absolute authority in the eyes of civilians. I don't want to mention this as the negative example of a, of a Aachen report because it contains very many very interesting insights. But it's interesting to note also that in the notes that I copied here, um, this research is more flexible, less rigid, less authoritarian, as long uh, uh, as uh, uh, the farther the further they they got into the country. Um, this means that this non uh, quanti quantifiable, this non positivist research that they started to do um, involved, of course, more or less more of them and a position of reflexivity that is very important for doing uh, a very, uh, the, the, the more interesting way of social research. Maurice Parloff is an example for an American Ritchie boy who was born in Cleveland in 1918 and was trained in Camp Ritchie because of his fluency in German. Parloff was one of those who had earned a degree in psychology from Western Uni uh, Reserve University in 1940 and a master's degree in social in psychiatric social work from the University of Chicago in 1942. Together with others, he formed the IPW Team 94, the so-called Kampfgruppe Palov, which also had the task of securing with the so-called T-Force technological industrial targets. And as such, they came to the concentration camp, to the liberated concentration camp, Mittelbau Dora. And Palov is very interesting for me, for my research, because he was writing letters back to his wife, Gloria, from July 1942 to November 45. And in sources like this, you can, of course, see the point of time in which uh, an awareness of the relevance uh, develops that goes beyond the immediate military uh, assignment. It's a uh, awareness for the historical significance of the events that they lived through, but also the sociological significance of the military activity itself. Perhaps if I were to keep a journal now, I would have quite an interesting volume by the time that I uh, return home. Nothing exciting, understand, but certainly quite amusing. Get the jobs that I've done and I'm doing now. What a strange episode in one's life is this war. A quote from one of his letters. 
What you can see here is that there is a desire to also record one's experiences in the field diary and to later publish it. Um, and it also illustrates the desire to place the event in one's own biography. Um, in my view, this shows very good that it was the activity of the interrogation teams more so than the military training that made the transformed, if you want, uh, the theoretically educated psychologist into practical social scientist. Another example would be Joseph W. Eaton. Quite unusually, Eaton was driving his Jeep from Luxembourg to Theresienstadt on May 9, 1945, which meant that he was not only crossing the borders between the American zone and the uh, uh, Russian, the Soviet zone, but also that he visited uh, Theresienstadt, the ghetto Theresienstadt, the last ghetto, as um, Anna Heiko has called it, just one day after its liberation. In addition to the personal um, search for relatives, and Eaton found the name of his grandmother on one of the lists of people who died at Theresienstadt, the task was also some kind of humanitarian repatriation of allied survivors, as well as the first description, as far as I can see, of a, of a um, liberator of Theresienstadt. In an 18-page paper called Theresienstadt Port of Embarkation to Death. He wrote very extensively and very uh, interestingly about Theresienstadt and also uh, started to work on a book project he called The Psychology of DPs in which he reflected um, his own feelings uh, towards the DPs and also refuted what he called the easy generalizations by the armed forces themselves. What I just want to say about this is that they were um, as I said, at some point, uh, having uh, the historical significance of the events as well as the sociological significance of their tasks. Why could they do that? Because they had to reflect their own position within the US Army. Being, as Albert Rosenberg said, um, always or very often conceived as abnormal. Um, I quote him saying, we were all very often not very welcome because we were outsiders. As Beverly Els, Eddie also wrote, for different reasons, as, as Jews, as non-Americans, as former enemy aliens, as communists, as native or African-Americans, many Ritchie boys were social outsiders. This made them, I would, I would argue, more aware for racism and anti-Semitism, not only in Germany and Austria, but also within the US Army and put them into a position of a critical distance to their own institution. This means that the tasks that they were uh, pursuing were, of course, assignment, military assignments, but also pursued in their own way of role making after role taking. Uh, they were working as outsiders from within, you could say. Again, a good example is uh, Joseph Eaton when he wanted to go to Buchenwald, he just wrote or he said in an interview, so I decided I would go to Buchenwald. All I had to do was to tell Captain Habe I'd like to go to Buchenwald. He said, fine. I got orders, you know, within a few hours and the driver and off we went. Uh, very much the same is true for his assignment for Theresienstadt. And of course, it's always uh, necessary to be critical of every source you find, especially of uh, interviews. But I think it's safe to say also from other accounts, that this shows considerable freedom to do their job, a kind of relative autonomy, not seldom in conflict. And this is very important with other parts of the armed forces, most of all, the military government structures. This means that um, if they wanted or not, they had to think uh, about habitus and identity, not only of others, but also thinking about their own roles. Um, Maurice Parloff, I mentioned before, noted down what he conceived as irritating conversations with and interactions in his letters. A recurring theme there is uh, a psychological derealization of the situation by German civilians. At the end of April, for example, uh, he meets two young German girls who claim that the Americans will never reach uh, Germany. Puzzled, Parloff looks at the other GIs and asks who she thought we were, if not Americans. The same is true for a postman who delivered mail to a house that no longer existed, a civil servant greeting him with the Hitler salute, an armaments manufacturer asking when he can start producing armaments again. 
And all these irritating interactions of post-Nazi mania of essentialization, Palov is addressed alternatively as an American officer, as a Jew, or as someone with Russian roots. So if he liked it or not, he had to think about questions of identity to the point of exhaustion. In one of his letters back to his wife, he wrote, I believe I have reached the saturation point. I'm tired of the civilians or any other German civilians. With German civilians, one is never able to forget that one is a soldier. I want to forget. Lucky for us, he didn't forget, uh, but contrarily reflected on his own position and on his encounters with Germans, German prisoners of war, and also with liberated uh, concentration camp uh, prisoners and those who were later to be called um, uh, displaced persons. Um, he was also, and this is very important, uh, reflecting on his own feelings towards uh, them, also reflecting his own anti-Semitism, as he himself called it, uh, since he didn't want to be identified with those liberated whose behavior was irritating to him as well. And one example I want to read uh, in full, if I have the time, uh, is this, because I think it shows very, very clearly uh, the combination of a humanitarian as well as a social science uh, perspective that can really make a difference in writing about Germany, Austria, and uh, the liberated concentration camps. I quote, I then went down to the vision and spoke to that character. He's going to one of those army officials uh, that uh, tried to do a resettlement of displaced persons of the Mittelbau Dora concentration camp and was surprised by the fact that uh, displaced persons didn't want to be resettled uh, without being asked. Um, I've spent few such unpleasant moments. He was not only impolite, but definitely insulting. He explained that he didn't give a good blankety blank blank them whether the Jews were taken or not. The only point that he could remember was that they had been given an opportunity to leave and had been either too stupid, too cowardly, or too disinterested to leave. Any attempt to remind him of the horrors that the people had suffered, of the effect that had had on them, of their ability to think clearly, of their lack of motivation, of their fear, was interrupted with cries that he was not in the least interested. I explained that the people wanted to go south. Impossible was the answer. Finally, he said, things don't look too good for your brethren. I guess that was supposed to be a dreadful insult. Somehow it didn't bother me. As I have said before, I had a dread of being associated with these Jews. Perhaps it was the fear that if I were actually like these Jews, then I too might yet suffer a similar fate. But now that the association has been made, I feel more relaxed. I think this is a very interesting passage of a letter that he wrote back because it shows in its entirety, entirety some uh, points that I want to make. First, American policy towards displaced person is here experienced as haphazard. Second, if these decisions were made by officers who followed only the logic of military logistics without giving any thoughts about uh, to psychology of those affected, um, or even, even only talking to them, this cannot work. Thirdly, the non-functioning then fuels the anti-Semitism of the American commanders, in this case, the Southern commander. Palo fourth comes in for balance by a psychology, psychologically conveying what the consequences of concentration camp imprisonment would have to mean for the survivors in an impressive punctuation based in no small part on reflection of his own earlier prejudices. Fifth, this leads to inter-military conflict the commander doesn't want to be lacked, just defends himself with open anti-Semitism, but solves the alleged log logistical problem um, with the recently feared open identif identification with dead Jews by a third party leading to agency and actual identification to for in the case of Palov. He ends here with a concern for the displaced persons um, who would become the pawns of geopolitics. Very much the same is to be observed in all of these reports that I'm, I'm dealing with. I mentioned the report of um, Joseph Eaton, uh, who also focused on the habitus of survivors. Uh, for example, uh, the way that those who went underground and had to mingle uh, um, between as Jews, uh, between among the, the Polish peasants, uh, had to learn how to cross the legs and how to, to do this or that. And that this kind of um, 
of habitus or habitual changes were not going away with uh, liberation and were so much the basis for uh, irritations to the American military authorities. Uh, what you can read in the case of his report about Theresienstadt uh, is a very complex, differentiated and sensitive report mentioning the cessation of menstruation uh, due to interviews with uh, female survivors, also describing the Jewish Ältestenrats, whose members he described as tightrope walkers in a very much more differentiated way than uh, decades of post-war accounts and, and uh, uh, historical research has done, but it was also self-critical of uh, the propaganda itself. So he quoted here, and this is also one thing that you can find very often because mostly the sources are not quoted in different reports on concentration camps and survivors were not given a voice to speak. But in this case, he quoted, I quote, one of the Polish Jews interviewed by this writer, a man who was in five concentration camps and fought with the Russian partisans in Poland, express the feeling that there is much hypocrisy in the Anglo-American propaganda. You take our pictures when we are dead, heaps of skeletons that make the stomach turn. Your statements weave with one another in denouncing the atrocities of the Nazis. But when we are alive, you have a chance to do something constructive for the tiny fraction that survived. Your ears and hearts are closed. This shows also that Eden uh, not only allowed uh, a survivor to speak in his report, in his 18-page uh, report, but also that he was criticizing the very own propaganda for which the psychological warfare division was responsibly call, uh, responsible, calling it uh, partly responsible for the non-existing policies towards uh, the DP question. So um, since time is running out, I think that this also shows the reason why the reports have not been used that much, not only by historical research, but also by the very propagandists that they were uh, compiled for. So it's a question of silencing and silence, um, unifying the five men I deal with. The reasons are manifold for the silence from the general clandestine character, a character of the intelligence to the only superficial use of propaganda. So there was for a very long time, no, um, real uh, modus, op modus operandi for investigating war crimes. And as well, it was no modus operandi for, for using uh, the so-called atrocity uh, stories for propaganda reason, because they feared on the one hand that it would be produce unclear effects, but also on the other hand, it was not um, considered decisive for the outcome of the war. Um, after the war, you also had the story of this way too critical reports not being of official use for uh, a psychological warfare, which quite uh, suddenly after 1945 uh, began to be prepared for the Cold War. This is a question of the Buchenwald report, which was considered too leftist, too critical, too communist friendly. And uh, the way the Buchenwald report was used was in this uh, case by Eugen Kogon, who was compiling this report for Albert Rosenberg and later writing his book, The SS Staat, The Theory and Practice of Hell in English, which became well known and widely read. Um, the question of silencing and silence is also, if I have uh, one minute, uh, something that's very interesting for me as a historian of the Austrian, of Austrian sociology that you see that not necessarily those five people that I deal with, but others were of course um, carrying out different activities after 1945, working for the CSC, the OSS, the research and analysis branch, the critical theories working there, working for the war crimes investigators at the Nuremberg trial, but also in the military government, setting up newspapers or surveying political attitudes of Germans and Austrians in the information services branch, uh, also something that really turned into a research uh, institutionalized in the Institute for Research into Public Opinion, which became the Austrian Gallup Institute in 1949. But Austrian sociology didn't choose to take this as the starting point of sociology after 1945, but only referred to uh, academic sociology, which was not only conservative, um, but was authoritarian in many ways and was also 
uh, even post Nazis, the post fascists uh, after 1945. Um, this is one example. Franz Ronneberger, who was a German sociologist, also working during the war in uh, Sankt Lambrecht, uh, which was a subcamp of Mauthausen uh, in Austria, in, the, in Styria. Uh, and was doing research on Southeast Europe uh, in this subcamp, where you, that you can see in the middle. And after the war, he was writing a book, a well known book about uh, sociology, but not under his own name, but under, uh, but, but under a pseudonym, uh, which he chose to be Stefan Lambrecht. The abbreviation for this is Sankt Lambrecht. So, what I want to state with this is that Austrian and German sociology. Uh, consisted of people sometimes that were calling themselves after a subcamp of a concentration camp, but did not at all uh, refer to the very interesting sociological and social scientist works done by survivors as well as liberators when they came to the concentration camps. I will leave it at that and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andreas for um, that presentation here. And again, um, we would uh, encourage now folks to use the, the Q&A box for um, questions um, for Andres after that really fascinating uh, discussion dealing with some really remarkable material there. Um, maybe I, I as, as people get some, um, their own ideas, I, I do have sort of one question and sort of a follow-up with what you were ending on, which sounds really quite quite interesting, um, in the history of your own discipline, sociology, and um, you're making the observation that some of these, I don't know, maybe we can call them practical sociologists um, who um, you are studying, these, these five individuals in particular, and I, I assume of, sort of that they're, they're part of a broader cohort, that their work had um, very little impact on the more formal uh, development of uh, sociology in the post-war period in in Austria and and Germany in particular. Um, my question is: Is there did their work did the work of these individuals that you're you're working on resonate in other parts of the academic discipline and other traditions and have a, a broader and more significant impact in shaping the study uh, of sociology? Thank you very much. This is a very interesting question that haunts me also uh, for a long time now. Um, I'd say the impact is not uh, that great. So it's an indirect uh, impact, as you can see in the case of Eugen Kogon, that uh, their research was flowing into their books, but also uh, right now it didn't really shape uh, sociology. It shaped more the history of the of, of concentration camps and the, the research on concentration camps but not so much sociology. So you have also sociologists in the 1980s and 1990s uh, writing from a sociological viewpoint about the concentration camps who did not refer to this earlier research, even though it was findable, even though it was published in some instances. And this has to do with the very um, strange uh, uh, Geschichtsvergessenheit, uh, the way uh, the sociology doesn't deal with its own history or history in general and decided not to deal with historical questions in many uh, instances anymore. And the state of historical sociology as well as the history of sociology. Um, but also, of course, in the case of Austria and, and Germany with uh, this post-war period and the post-fascist, post-Nazi period of setting up uh, these uh, uh, disciplines in a very conservative uh, manner, expelling uh, people that were forced to flee the country, not inviting them back and not referring to this kind of knowledge and knowledge production. This is, on the one hand, a very Austrian and German topic. On the other hand, it's a very sociological topic because uh, Elmar Lachterhand, I I mentioned here was presenting his research, for example, in the 1970s, later on interviewing uh, perpetrators in a small uh, city of, of Germany, perpetrators, bystanders, if you want to call them like this, and survivors in a small village. 
And when he presented this to a oral history or to a sociology conference, uh, he was asked or, or, or the audience was asked to observe a minute of silence, which is a very uncommon, unusual kind of reaction to, to sociological research. And I think this is very symptomatic for the way sociologists would know how to deal with research on national socialism. And also this is, this is, I think the answer would be twofold. There is a very special Austrian and German problem. Uh, to this and uh, also a special problem within the, the social sciences, the disciplines. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question uh, from Joachim Savelsberg. Uh, he, he, he writes, how do the studies you describe address the fate of those stigmatized back home, especially inmates with the pink triangle who suffered the highest mortality rate in the concentration, not extermination camps, and experienced massive discrimination also after their release. Yes, thank you very much. This is also a very good uh, question. There's of course not one single answer to this, but as I said, in the case of the so-called uh, Ältestenrat in Theresienstadt, uh, this research is much more subtle and much more uh, complicated than much of the research done later. So, for example, uh, Luchter and I mentioned also uh, interviewed survivors in uh, the United States, and among these uh, survivors were people of uh, categories of SS categories who were neglected in historiography for a long time. I don't remember someone with the pink triangle, as you mentioned, but uh, I remember. Uh, one so-called criminal prisoner and one so-called anti-social prisoner in, in Nazi uh, um, words. So there were even people uh, who they interviewed and uh, stories that they told and wrote about, which are much more interesting than much you could read after that. But uh, of course, it's not uh, that... Uh, that elaborated. So in the case of the Buchenwald report, you can see this um, an interesting effect uh, concerning also the, the um, uh, supposedly or, 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 or real homosexual prisoners of the concentration camps is that uh, one of one report in the Buchenwald report was written by someone who uh, Albert Rosenberg uh, in his uh, private papers called a homosexual prisoner or referred to as a homosexual prisoner. Uh, and he was writing about uh, the fate of the homosexuals within Buchenwald. And Eugen Kogon later on took this text and uh, included it into his own text, changing the position of the writer uh, without reflecting on how this change of the position would change the meaning of the text. So it's it's a long story. It's maybe too long for, for explaining this. But my answer would be that there is a lot of subtle research uh, in this early research to be found, which was later on either forgotten or not referred to anymore, or even uh, used in uh, in dubious ways. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the cohort um, of the five individuals that are, are forming the basis of your study. I, I would assume that you could have gone in, in a different direction. You're pulling, I guess, from some of the, the Ritchie boys. And and um, how large a cohort is it? And, and could you have chosen a completely different set of researchers, which would have given you a very different perspective on your problem. Yes, this is also a very, very good question. Of course, the uh, the sampling that I did is not as sociological as uh, dictated by the sources I can use. So um, this is, to me, the five most important, five most interesting uh, cases producing this kind of knowledge and also uh, of people who also became social scientists after the war. So there is, of course, there are tons of collections of uh, other Ritchie boys as well as OSS or um, OWI or whatever um, institution they come from uh, members, which you could also use on. Um, I think, uh, so I can't really answer the question if the, the outcome would be different. I think there is, of course, some 
different kind of knowledge that was not that subtle that was produced by people also in this intelligence work but i think that overall you can really see the difference of this kind of knowledge production this was for me the basis for for uh this sampling um is different compared to others so if you for example see that uh, there are reports by military government um, officers of buchenwald of mauthausen of dachau there are a lot of flaws there are a lot of errors there are a lot of uh, um, rumors that are presented as facts because they don't really uh, refer to any kind of uh, sources for their for their um for what they write the differences are quite huge so i think that this that there is something unifying all these uh, reports even though i'm only f focusing on these five cases i would i would say there are other many many other cases of uh, this um, subtle knowledge that, that was produced i mean thank you very much um I, I actually think that's it then with with the the questions we um thank you very much for uh, again, I'm sorry that we we couldn't host you, um, though I think um, it all worked out for the best anyway. Um, we're, we really look forward to the, the publication of your work and, and how this study will eventually come out. Um, thanks for giving us a snapshot, an introduction to it, and we uh, look forward to further contact in the future. So I'm sure I can say on behalf of all our participants and listeners today, thank you very much for taking the time and, and being with us today. Thank you very much again for the invitation. It was a pleasure.